Firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge the Wadjuk Noongar people as the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting today and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Just a little bit of housekeeping to start with. Um, if you need to go to the bathroom, it's just through the door there on the right, or you can go past the tea and coffee station around, around to the right as well. Um, we may be taking some photographs today just of the room and this, just a general couple of photos for Twitter. So if um, you don't want to be any photographs, please let myself or Kat know. If there's an emergency, um, we just need to go down the stairs and across the road to um, where the lake is, just directly opposite, opposite and meet there, please. Um, could you please turn your telephones to silent or off? Um, of course, if you need to take a call, absolutely fine. Please just step out of the room. Uh, for people dialing in from other locations around WA, if you have any questions for our presenters during the course of the morning, can you please use the questions tab on the GoToWebinar panel? And just to let you know, there will be a morning tea break around 10 a.m. or so. So a bit about Injury Matters. Injury Matters is a for-purpose, not-for-profit agency leading the way in preventing injuries and supporting recovery in Western Australia. Our aspiration is that all West Australians live life uninterrupted by injury. We do this through the provision of injury prevention programs and services. We achieve our mission through the delivery of these three core programs, Stay On Your Feet, Road Trauma Support and No Injury. Road Trauma Support is a statewide service providing free counselling sessions for anyone affected by road trauma regardless of when the incident occurred or what level of involvement the person had. Stay On Your Feet is WA's Falls Prevention Program for older adults living in the community. Stay On Your Feet aims to reduce falls and fall-related injuries among older adults living in the community and encourage confidence and independent living. And the third program is No Injury, which aims to enhance the capacity of people and organisations to deliver evidence-informed injury prevention and community safety activities. We'd like to recognise the WA Department of Health for funding the No Injury Program. So how can Injury Matters support you? We can oh, one more button. support you through um, training and events, uh, helping with networking, resources, data, free support, which is the road trauma counselling, and through grants also. For today's seminar, we have four um, wonderful presentations today uh, from Michelle Hobday, Peter Palomara, Rose Power and Christine Smith. The Injury Matters supports our partners by delivering training and today's seminar is being delivered to support you in a practical way. Part of our business is supporting capacity building with our partners by facilitating opportunities to share information and learn from others to help improve behaviours and environments. So our first presentation today will be from Dr. Michelle Hobday. Michelle is an epidemiologist with an interest in road safety. A former physiotherapist with experience working with victims of road trauma, she has a master's in public health and a PhD in epidemiology. She has been working at the Curtin Monash Accident Research Centre, CMARC, since 2015. She has been involved in projects including pedestrian and cyclist safety, alcohol-related crashes, road safety in children and young adults, and intersection safety. I would like to welcome Michelle. Um, also, just to let you all know, because it is a webinar today, people can hear in the room, just to make you aware if you are making comments that they are heard by a larger audience. Good morning. Uh, so just a quick overview. So Glenda has asked me to speak this morning um, just to give an overview of crash risk among young drivers. So I'm going to be presenting quite a lot of numbers in the first half of my presentation just to give a kind of a baseline to the idea of road safety um, among young adults and young drivers generally. And then looking at risk factors for crashes among this group of road users. 
So young drivers and other young road users are classified as vulnerable road users in the same way that pedestrians or motorcyclists are considered uh, vulnerable road users. Um, their crash rates exceed the crash rates of middle-aged and older drivers. Um, and the most dangerous time for driving is in the first three to six months of the probationary periods, the, the red peas. Um, Drivers aged 17 to 20 years are, are the highest risk age group, even compared to 21 to 25 year old um, drivers. So this is just going to be an overview of road safety generally in um, Australia. So this is having a look at um, the number of fatalities that have occurred across all age groups across the whole of Australia over a over a, um, a long, a prolonged period, so a, about 10 years. If you have a look at this, you can see the number of crashes in blue, and the black, uh, the brown line is showing the number of, uh, as a rate, so the number of crashes per distance travelled. Um, you can have, you can see that overall, there's been a gradual decrease in the number of fatalities over that 10-year period across Australia among all um, all age groups. And this has kind of plateaued or increased slightly over the last few years. Um, likewise, the rate per thousand kilometres has gradually dropped over the time period that has kind of plateaued or even slightly increased in the last couple of years. And then looking um, at the rate per population. So um, obviously the population in Australia has increased quite dramatically um, over the last 20 to 30 years. So you can see that although the fatalities have not necessarily decreased very rapidly, there's been a gradual decrease in the, num the rate of crashes per population over the study period, but it's plateaued out in the last few years. And then this, instead of looking at fatalities, is looking at hospitalizations over about 15 years. And again, oops, sorry. Um, you can see that there's been actually been an increase in the number of hospitalized injuries over time. Um, and even per population, per thousand or by 100,000 population, that race of hospitalized injuries has increased quite, um, quite significantly over the sort of 2005 to 2010 period, and then has dropped. It's quite difficult to say what's been happening in the last five to seven years because the data hasn't um, in certain jurisdictions has, has been a bit problematic, so we can't get a very big good picture of serious injuries. Um, and then looking at all road users by, um, by age group, so you've got your youngest ones here up to, they're actually one or two aged 100 and 101 who were fatally injured in road crashes across Australia over the 30 years, um, males in orange, females in, in blue, and you can see this massive increase over, over the young age group, um, sort of the 18 to kind of, I'd say sort of 25 to 30 year olds, is this massive increase. And in fact, across all age groups, except the very young, males are leading the way in terms of the proportion of, of, of males involved in fatal injuries. And then looking, um, by road user type. So I've divided it simply into other road users who are the green and blue, which is the drivers. Um, you can see that fortunately there are no four-year-olds driving, although there was an 11-year-old. Um, and you can see that kind of roughly 40% or so of drivers in the age group that we're interested in who fatally injured are drivers and the remains are other road users. And it sort of gradually, the proportion of drivers drops um, with age. So now we're going to look at young road users. And, and for the purposes of this presentation, unless I say anything else, I'm defining young road users as 16 to 25 year olds. So looking at selected states over the same um, 30 year period, looking at fatalities across Australia, you can see that there's been a pretty dramatic drop from the late 80s, early 90s in fatalities. Um, I'm just looking at the states with the higher number of crashes because with the smaller states, it's difficult to see patterns. 
Um, so you can see this dramatic drop, um, which is kind of gradually the drop has slowed down. So although it's generally speaking, dropping in some places, there's actually been an increase or it's plateaued. And then looking at WA and no, there weren't more crashes in WA than they than there were in Australia. It's just that I've used a different axis so that it's clearer. But you can see a fairly steady drop across Australia, whereas in Western Australia it's also a drop, but kind of pretty bumpy ride. Um, and this kind of peak again in 2015. Um, a bit muddling, but looking by hour of day. For me, which I find quite fascinating. So this is your early morning, daytime and late night. And you can see that green, which is Tasmania, people obviously uh, go out earlier in the evening because the peak in Tasmania is kind of more around eight o'clock at night for fatal, uh, fatal crash involvement. And New South Wales, you're looking more around midnight. And I suspect that this is, you can see very clearly that nighttime and early morning are very high risk times. Um, and the variations across the states have probably got to do with what time nightclubs are open, trading hours of alcohol outlets, um, uh, patterns of, of, of nighttime activity overall. And then looking at run, young, Rosa in, a little, young road user injuries just in Western Australia over the last four years, um, I've divided it out into the, the different road users. Drivers, clearly, um, this is your sort of 16 to 25 year old drivers, clearly make up most of the injuries that have occurred. Um, you can see down here the sort of burnt orange at the bottom is the fatalities. It's quite interesting that although motorcycle riders make up a relatively small proportion of all injuries, they've probably got a, a much bigger um, number of fatalities, proportionally speaking, to the other road users. Um, and then medical treatments seem to make up a very high proportion of um, crashes. So people who weren't hospitalized but needed some form of medical treatment after the crash. And then looking at day, day of the week, um, in Western Australia, and this is fatalities again, depending on what kind of data we had. This is the 30 year period again. You can see very clearly that for pretty much all road user groups, it's all happening on Saturday and Sunday, and to a lesser extent on Friday. So it's clearly related to weekend activity rather than nighttime activity with um, young road users. So I'm now going to focus specifically on road, uh, on drivers not just on all road users um, that are 16 to 25. So you can have a look here. I've got a rate per population. You can see that in the fatalities, there were nearly 100 fatalities per 100,000 population among 19-year-olds. Uh, as you can see, the numbers are very small, so um, fortunately. So we can't really draw any conclusions um, with the rates with fatalities. If you look at hospitalized um, young drivers where the numbers are larger, the peaks are occurring in rates in the 19, 21 year olds and 24 year olds. And for medical treatment crashes, <coughs> the highest rates uh, for medical treatment crashes were in the 23 and 24 year old age group. So for some reason, 19, 20 and 24 seem to be the age groups where things are happening. Then looking at fatalities by age and gender. Um, so you can see that the highest proportion of male crashes occurs among the 21 year olds and 28 year olds, a 24 year old. So 80% of all crashes in these two age groups occur to males and only 20% are females that are fatally injured. And the highest number of young driver fatalities, as we could see from the slide before, um, the 240 fatalities among those aged 18 in the last 30 years. Last numbers, so you've hung in there. Um, this is just looking at young driver injuries, um, so the different types, fatal, hospital, medical treatment, and no medical treatment required. Again, the 19-year-olds are where the fatalities have tended to be. Um, the males, there were 92% of the fatalities were um, um, in the 19-year-olds were male. Um, with hospitalizations, the 20-year-olds, um, the highest number were, were, was 50. The 50 males were involved um, in hospitalized crashes. 
And then looking at medical treatment, um, the highest number were actually among females, not males. So interestingly enough, although in the other injury types, the fatal hospitalization and no medical treatments, the males definitely beat the women. Um, in the medical treatment only, there were actually generally a higher proportion of females who required medical treatment. And last one, this is just looking at young driver involvement by, day, um, by hour of the day and day of the week in Western Australia. And you can see the green is Friday night. Okay, all these, this peak of crashes in the late evening on a Friday night. Again, Saturday and Sunday here, you can see this peak between midnight and sort of five, six in the morning in um, crashes in Western Australia specifically. So this is just interesting because it will actually feed into what we talk about later in terms of the factors that, that have been shown by researchers being involved in risk. So the cost of injuries to young drivers um, to us overall as a community. So the TAC in Victoria did a study um, looking at all young driver claims to be ins for insurance between 2005 and 2013. So there were nearly 17,000 claims in drivers between 18 and 25 years over this eight year period. The lifetime cost just in Victoria for young drivers in those eight years was $634 million in that one state. 46 of the claimants were males, but they accounted for 75% of that 634 million. So the injuries tended to be more severe. And finally, 28 of the drivers were classified as high severity. So they needed long-term care and they accounted for 35%, $219 million of the total of $634 million that was required in these claims. So it's a lot of, it's a very expensive business. Um, I'm now going to talk about risk factors for road crashes among young drivers. I'm leaning very heavily on some work that's been done by Dr. Bridie Scott Parker, who's in Queensland, I think at Sunshine Coast University, um, and I'm using her frameworks. Um, so thank you very much in your absence, Bridie. Um, very useful frameworks that she's come up with just putting the whole thing together. So this is just um, looking at the source of driving risk among young people. So firstly, watch the type of car that's driven. When? When do young drivers drive? Why they drive? And how the emotions alter how they drive? And how they drive? The behaviour involved in how they drive. So what type of car is driven? So importantly, uh, the age and the size of the car um, affect crash risk. So smaller and older cars are um, higher crash risk. The safety features, so um, airbags, ABS, and the other newer technologies um, to do with safety. Um, came across a very interesting little study where someone asked some young male drivers what they valued in their first car, performance, looks, the sound system, and whether it was modifiable, and asked the parent, and the parent's desire was for, for a safe vehicle for their young driver. So there's a very clear inequality between what the young male wants in his first car and what his parents would like for him. Um, and then also who bought the car and what they consider desirable facts for the first car, leading it on from that. And was the car shared with parents? So um, young drivers who have primary access to a car tend to have a higher crash risk than young drivers who share a car with their parents. So when do young drivers drive? As we saw from the previous slides, it tends to be at night time, particularly Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, the factors that are often associated with nighttime driving, so fatigue, study workloads, and also driving in conflict with our circadian rhythms, leading to um, sleepy driving um, and other issues. Then alcohol is often consumed by young people on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights, if not at other times as well. And then illicit drugs, cannabis, speed, cocaine, and ecstasy are often involved um, when young drivers are driving at this time. How do young drivers drive? So young drivers like, often like speed. Their use of speed, 
seat belts might be more erratic than older age groups, uh, risky driving maneuvers, um, using mobile phones and other forms of distraction, and then errors just through lack of experience. Why do they drive? So um, personally, I drive because I have to get from one place to another. Um, some people drive because they enjoy driving, but I think for me, evidence has shown that for many young drivers, it's a form of independence which supersedes their need for transport. Um, and the desire to experience excitement may drive, maybe why they drive. And what affects why they drive like they do? So the emotions, um, and I think this is particularly the case with young drivers who are still developing. Um, anger, excitement may lead to them driving faster, make them more erratic. Their state of physical health, mental health, so depression and anxiety may affect um, how they're feeling, may affect the way that they drive. Um, medical conditions such as ADHD, and then also personality. Um, young drivers who are sensation seekers and they find it thrilling to drive at speed. Other factors, um, the age of the driver and the age of receiving the license to drive independently. So the brain continues to mature into the mid-20s and so the decisions made by a 17, 18, 19 year old may be a little bit not ideal um, because that capacity for making decisions is still developing. And then people that age are subject still to peer pressure, they're still forming their identities, and this affects how they drive. Um, the gender of the driver, so young drivers tend to drive more than fem young females, and just that sheer extra exposure to driving increases their crash risk. Um, it's been suggested in some research that driving is an extension of masculinity. Um, and then personality factors, as I mentioned before, so sensation seeking um, can affect their risk of crash. Um, other things include being Australian born versus um, being a migrant. So those who are relatively new migrants tend to take less risk than Australian born young drivers or migrants who've been in Australia for sort of 10 years plus. Um, there's been a study that's shown with those with less education and who are unemployed have had multiple speeding violations, but the reasons for that are unknown. And then urban versus rural driving. So in urban areas, there's a higher crash risk, but in rural areas, there's a higher fatality risk. Um, the various reasons why this might be, it could be related to traveling faster on rural roads. It could also be that access to medical treatment, there may be longer periods to get to a hospital and so actually risk of fatality increases just because of delayed access to medical treatment. Um, and then looking at passengers, so the age of passengers, um, younger passengers um, in the car is associated with higher risk. Um, we see this all the time, lots of, I see it a lot, I've got a 14 year old and you hear about all these parents who are so excited that their child is going to get onto its red peas because now they can give their 14 year old and their 12 year old a lift to school and I won't have to drive them anymore and I always feel horrified because I would not want my 17 year old driving my 14 year old who's arguing with my 12 year old in the back of the car um, when they already are not a very experienced driver. Um, and it's very distracting having bickering siblings in the back of your car. And research has shown that this is an issue. The gender of the passengers, so young male, male drivers with young male passengers, higher crash risk, and more passengers, more risk. Then social influences, and this is very interesting, that the attitudes of parents towards driving actually impacts on how young drivers um, drive. So another one is X is attitudes towards police inform enforcement. So if a parent is showing a, a lack of respect for police enfor enforcement and for the rules of the road, often young drivers will mimic that. Um, and if they, if they drive in a risky fashion and their parents don't take any action, for example, they um, total their car and their parent just buys them another car and there's no sanction from the parent, that's associated with um, high riskier driving from young adults. Then peers, um, the requirement for social approval, showing off and trying to fit in. 
is definitely a factor in risky driving practices. And then finally, other young drivers. So young drivers see how other young drivers drive on the roads or what they see on TV or advertising and they will tend to fit in with those the same kind of attitudes. So if they see risky driving, they'll drive in a more risky fashion. And if other people are safer, they'll tend to go with that as well. So in conclusion, there are many, it is a very complex issue. There are so many factors that feed into young drivers and their safety on the road. I'm just highlighting on the slide two big issues, um, alcohol, and the number of young passengers. Um, and thank you very much. So this is just a very brief uh, reference list, lots more available. Certainly not in Western Australia. Peter, is there anything in Victoria, maybe, um, about young, Victoria, certainly time of day? I guess what you're saying, it highlights the fact that the young driver safety is such a complex issue with all these multiple in interconnected things. But another thing to say, I think, is that what worries me about young drivers driving their sort of teenagers or younger children is that it's actually socially acceptable. You know, I mean, I hear it all the time. Oh, thank goodness. Um, and I mean, I've read articles about how having a dog in your car can increase your crash risk. So imagine having a couple of bickering kids. Uh, yeah, that's generally, I think, has been the case when you've got a peer age passenger. And why that is the case, it could be the distraction or possible off or whatever, but having younger age If you're not distracted. <laughs> it's quite yeah. frightening though when you look at the graph of, of crashes across age groups and you look at that red P, it's like phew, huge peak and then things start to drop. It's, it's very clear. So, yeah, I wouldn't do it. Thank you, Michelle. So our next presenter is Peter Palamara. Peter has worked in road safety and road injury research for nearly 25 years across three university research centres. His areas of expertise include the application of psychological theory to road user behaviour, young and novice drivers, traffic enforcement, distracted and impaired driving, safe vehicles and the planning, implementation and evaluation of road safety countermeasures. 
Over the years, he has undertaken research on behalf of the WA Road Safety Council, the Federal Department of In Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government. Um, the Criminology Research Council of Australia, Austroads and the Driver Licensing Authorities of Victoria and New South Wales. He is also a past member of the State Government Road Safe, Youth Road Safety and Driver Training and Licensing Task Forces. After leaving the Curtin Monash Accident Research Centre at the end of 2018, Peter has established the Strategic Injury Research and Education Consultancy, where he acts as the principal consultant. He is also the current secretary of the West Australian chapter of the Australasian College of Road Safety. Thanks, Peter. <coughs> Thanks very much for that. Um, my focus is again going to be on young drivers because they are the bigger transport problem and particularly when you consider that a lot of the young passenger injuries will also occur in relation to a young driver. It makes most sense to sort of look at the young driver issue there. Um, let's move it on. Is this one working? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Was it? Does it stop working? It stop working. That's all right. I can just use the keys. Yeah. So have you? Has that skip forward a few? Yeah. Like it's not showing up on the screen. Is it changing on your screen, Kat? This is like it's stuck. Let's go to resume slideshow to see. Oh, there we okay, go. That's All right, that's, okay. that's much better. Okay. Right. In um, presenting today, what I'm going to do, because I know that most of you here will be most familiar with this, is, is, is look at the issues in relation to the safety system construct because that's what also guides uh, our current WA road strategy and the one into the future, I guess, and pretty much the strategies of most other Western countries as well. Um, and it really does provide a nice opportunity, that framework provides a nice opportunity to understand or appreciate a lot of the risk factors and countermeasures. So when we're talking about young driver problems, we can look at the four main pillars of the safe systems theory to get an understanding of where to intervene. So some of the issues that I'll cover are the biopsychosocial preparedness for driving and countermeasures for that, errors in risk taking, driver distraction and tension, vehicle safety and crash type. I'll talk about the graduated driver training and licensing program that we have in WA, not in any great detail because again, I expect most of you will know the details of that program. And then I'll have some sort of motherhood type statements about how can we sort of try and move forward here in regards to young drivers and reducing injury there. So the first thing that we know or appreciate from a safe systems perspective is, is that people will make mistakes, they will make errors, they will take risks and the like. And I guess up until probably the last decade and a half, we've pretty much had fairly much an individual focus, which pretty much puts the responsibility on the individual rather than back on the system itself. And, and safe systems is about recognising it's not just the individual behind the wheel or the pedestrian or the cyclist uh, who has to be considered, but all elements of that, that road use system, so to speak. And that's why we can break it up into safe road use, uh, safe vehicles, safe speed, safe roads and roadsides, and even safe governance or governance per se. And this is really quite an important issue because if you compare WA, for example, with jurisdictions like Victoria, Western Australia used to have a, a really good, and by good I mean lower fatality rate than Victoria had 
then things really flipped around in the mid 80s. And the question has been asked, why is it that WA sort of fell behind Victoria? And I think one of the things that was instrumental in Victoria performing a lot better in terms of road safety over many years was the establishment of the Transport Accident Commission in Victoria. In other words, it's a governance issue. And I think in WA, we've struggled to find the right governance. And by governance, I mean what we introduce, how quickly we introduce it, what sort of resources we throw at it. Whereas in Victoria, it has taken a more substantial approach to things. So when I talk about this material today, I'll talk about it within the framework of safe road use. The other thing about the safe system is that it acknowledges that um, death and serious injury should not be the accepted outcome of people making mistakes or taking risks and the like. So again, it puts the onus back on those responsible for governance to actually ensure that if people do make mistakes or take risks, they should necessarily pay with our lives. Now, I, I guess the shift that we've seen over time from this personal responsibility to system responsibility can be summed up a bit like, you know, in the old days, we might have said, what idiot ran into that light pole? Now we're saying, well, what idiot put that light pole in that place for somebody to run into? So the responsibility is back on the system, first and foremost, about how you design your roads, how you set up your transport system, and then how people relate to that. So if we're looking at young drivers and safe roads, Michelle has already acknowledged that there is a physiological and psychological immaturity that those at the age of 17 are actually faced with. Um, would you necessarily want a 17-year-old commercial airline pilot? Would you be thinking they don't necessarily have the maturity to actually undertake that? But we sort of accept that on our roads, that our road network is, is rife with people of a particular age and have particular problems in terms of their underdeveloped cognitive and perceptual capabilities to actually drive uh, safely. They have poor impulse control and the like. There's, as Michelle has already said, they're subject to peer group pressure and, um, and they're likely to abuse um, substances which impair driving performance as they try to develop a sense of self. 17 years is the minimum licensing age, but some people seem to think it is also the mandatory licensing age. And it's very hard to convince people that you don't necessarily have to get a license at 17. And now I'll probably refer now and again to the test cases of my own four sons. I made it very clear to them, and I guess they were never going to argue with me about this, that they were just never going to get their license at 17, no matter what they said. But in the, in the process, we had to accept that we would be driving them around a lot more. So, you know, I had one son that didn't get it till he was nearly 20, another one was 19, and the last two, the twins, they were about 18 and a half when we allowed them to get their licence. They accepted that because they had an appreciation from me about the risks of being a younger age driver, and particularly a male driver. So what should we be doing, if anything, to try and dissuade people from getting a license at 17 years? But as Michelle has already mentioned, there are parents out there that want their kids to get their license early. So in fact, they can be driving sort of younger age siblings around. I personally believe that we should be putting in place incentives, which actually try and delay licensure. And they can be from financial incentives to transport incentives. I have to say, I think the advent of things like Uber and, and Ola have actually created sort of public transport options, private public transport options, which allow young people to sort of leave the car at home and not take risks at night. Inexperience versus age is a, is a risk factor here. Now we know that age and experience are highly correlated. At 17 years of age, you had very limited experience. Um, by 25 years of age, you have more experience. So what you're getting over time is, is maturation in terms of the ability to drive and experience is the ability to drive. However, what we do know from other research that older age novices have a lower crash risk than younger age novices. So in other words, again, if you can delay licensure and you know, take that point as a countermeasure, there are some benefits to be gained from that. As Michelle has highlighted, that risk of crashing is highest in the early period of licensing, 
but it does decrease with time. Some research that we did in the past, I think in the first year compared to the fifth year, your risk of being involved in a police reported crash was four times higher in that first year relative to that fifth year. So there's a lot of incentive, there should be a lot of incentive for actually trying to delay licensure because of the lack of experience and, and that lack of um, physiological maturity there. So what do GDT and L programs do? They basically try to safeguard young drivers in those initial years of licensing where they are at risk for certain psychological and physiological reason and also because of a lack of experience. So GDT and L programs actually try and manipulate and control the exposure of young people so that they are developing experience under low risk situations. And an important part of that is really about learner drivers getting a high degree of supervised driving. There was some initial early evidence that suggested it had to be around 100, 120 hours. That's still somewhat questionable. But then also driver trainers raised the issue about, yeah, perhaps you've got parents actually passing on poor skills, poor attitudes and the like. And certainly research has actually demonstrated that there is a relationship between the sort of driver a young driver becomes and those who are supervising them. So personality as a risk factor, Michelle has also mentioned impulsivity and sensation seeking. We know that varies with age and gender. It's higher when you're younger. It's higher amongst males as well. There's no surprise in all of that. And we know it's predictive of speeding offences in the first three years of licensure. So again, we have aspects from a countermeasure point of view. How do you deal with personality per se? We're not going to screen young drivers from getting a license based on a personality test. And people may think it's very hard to manipulate personality, but what you can do is try and control the environment under which they drive. So we have aspects of GDT and L programs, in other words, to reduce the mirror points that are available to drivers in the first two years. As a signal to young drivers, you are very easily going to lose your license if you display this risk-taking behaviour, for example, speeding. Um, in New South Wales, for example, even one speeding offence can lead to a suspension of the licence. It's a different situation here. I, I'll keep referring to GDT and L because in terms of countermeasures, that's probably been the most significant change um, to young drivers and their risk of crashing and injury. Now, error due to experience versus risk taking here. We seem to sort of throw them both up in the air. Um, but it's very hard to understand what really is at play when you look at a particular crash. For example, if you're traveling too fast through a curve and lose control and you crash, what is that due to? Is that due to intentional risk taking or is it non-intentional risk taking due to a lack of experience? And again, this is where GDT and L programs kick in in terms of their benefits is trying to develop experience under a range of situations the young novice drivers so they can start to appreciate the risks that certain road conditions present. Now, when you're supervising young drivers, this is what I did with my sons, I particularly chose areas around the Perth metropolitan area I knew that would be troubling and wanted them to drive through those areas whilst they were under supervision because that is when they're safest. Yeah. There is this role of optimism bias, and when it comes to sort of error versus risk taking here, young drivers don't necessarily think that it's risk taking because they have an inflated sense of their own abilities as drivers and don't actually believe they will come to grief. On the basis of that, some people like to expose young drivers, you know, through driver training environments where they lose control of vehicles. In a controlled situation, I think that can be beneficial, but not from the point of view of trying to teach them how to get out of that situation, but just to explain how there are limitations to one's abilities and skills in the very initial early stages of licensure. When it comes to distracted and inattentive driving, um, Everyone will firstly look at mobile phones, the influence of peers in the vehicle, alcohol and drugs, and even sleep deprivation, because they're all 
um, documented causes and risk factors for involvement in crashes and contributors to injury. And it was very interesting today. I, I saw a young lady, I was in the right turn lane. She was in the car beside me. She was clearly looking down, looking up, looking down, looking up. And in the process of looking down, she didn't happen to see the motorcycle police officer coming up between the lanes. And he was looking, and I was watching him in the rear vision mirror, and he was just looking in vehicles in the two lanes of traffic. And then he stopped by my car and he looked in her car and he just kept looking and she's still on her phone. And then he signaled to her to up ahead, pull over. Happens all the time. Yeah. Now, why are issues like mobile phone use and alcohol and drugs particularly problematic for young drivers? And it's because they don't have the ability in the very early stage to multitask. They don't develop that spare attentional capacity to be able to drive and do other things. Us as experienced drivers, we can daydream a bit. We can have conversations with others and we can still maintain safe driving focus. Young drivers don't. Their field of vision is pretty much around the car. They don't drive cars ahead like we tend to do in terms of we're predicting what is happening. Young drivers don't get that. They don't understand that yet. They're very restricted. Now, there could be an argument here for actually saying, just before I go on to alcohol there, there could be an argument for saying we should ban all mobile phone use amongst young drivers, you know. Not, not just handheld, but all mobile phone use because they don't have that spare attentional capacity to undertake these telephone conversations and talk uh, and drive at the same time. When it comes to alcohol, for a long period of time, we've acknowledged that we should have lower alcohol levels for young drivers. Why is that the case? We've had this belief that in the early years of licensure, they're not able to deal with alcohol and the effects of alcohol that well. And us as drivers, probably some of us, have had the experience of having too much to drink, but we've still managed to get home because of our skill as a driver can compensate for the, the effects of alcohol. Young drivers can't do that. For many years in WA, we had 0.02 legislation for young novice drivers, for provisional drivers. That never made any sense to me, particularly when you had the uh, Drive Safe Handbook saying, the limit is 0.02, but you're better off driving with no alcohol in your system. So why just didn't we make it zero alcohol? And digging into that, I actually managed to find, and this was through work that we did for the RAC some years ago, we actually found that the 0.02 legislation came about by default because of the testing instrumentation at the time wasn't as sophisticated as nowadays and they weren't as comfortable as prosecuting somebody down to below levels of 0.02, so they said 0.02. Eventually, after this work we did with the um, RAC, it promoted enough evidence to suggest that we should be moving to zero, and thankfully that's what we did see over time with GDT and our program. It actually shifted from 0.02 to zero there. So I've already said, you know, should we ban mobile phone use? Now, is sleep deprivation going to be the big issue here? What I'm trying to highlight here are these risk factors for young drivers and how we should best respond to them. How are we responding to sleep deprivation amongst young drivers? I've actually found this a difficult thing to get across to my sons. They will go out, come home late, two o'clock in the morning or whatever, and then they're up by six o'clock going off to whatever it is they want need to do, whether it's work or whatever. And I'm trying to get across to them that they really are impaired by the lack of sleep. And I think this is really the next forefront here. It's the next battleground for us uh, in terms of young drivers is because they're burning candles at a, at a lot of ends. They're working, they're studying, they're playing hard as well. And sleep is something that can be left behind. Just in regards to young drivers and safe road use, I think it's important to remember that pretty much people drive as they live. And other research has found when we've looked at things like speeding behaviour and drink driving, we've actually found that those drivers who are more susceptible to those sorts of behaviours are also the same sort of drivers that don't necessarily use sunscreen, 
don't exercise as much, tend to drink too much and tend to smoke. And so the way people drive is in fact an extension of the way we live our lives more generally. So when it comes to countermeasures for young drivers, we shouldn't be isolating the behaviour of driving from the broader way of how you live. We should be looking at it as part of a total package about trying to get people to behave in ways which are very protective of their health in general. And I think Sadira does a good job of that in regards to alcohol and, and drugs. Safe vehicles, this is really an important and very much an emerging area here. We know that safe vehicles are about primary safety and secondary safety. Primary safety being about those features of vehicles that help mitigate the involvement in crashes. Secondary safety is about those features such as seat belts, occupant safety protection cells, airbags, which, which actually reduce the risk of injury. And so the early focus particularly was on probably secondary safety. Uh, when you looked at uh, the ANCAP and used car safety rating findings, they were all about looking at the protection against injury uh, for vehicle occupants, particularly drivers in both these cases here. But the contemporary focus really now is on those features that help you avoid getting involved in a crash, like the autonomous emergency braking, the forward collision warning, the lane departure warning, lane keeping assist and whatever. And all of these features, there's very strong evidence to show that they are effective in helping all drivers, not just young drivers, have actually avoid being involved in a crash. Um, of particular interest to me is electronic stability control. And that is the feature that stops you from running off the road. Um, and unfortunately, as I'll show you in a little minute, is that it's not always a feature that young drivers have in their cars because they're driving older cars. We know there is a very strong association between age of vehicle and safe vehicle features and injury severity. So essentially, the older the car that you have, the less likely it is to be a crash-worthy car and the greater the risk of injury. There's very clear evidence around that. But what is it with young novice drivers? We tend to we understand that they, they're drivers of older vehicles, they're less crash worthy vehicles. So they have fewer primary crash avoidance features, so they're lower in, um, and they're also lower in crash worthiness. And we know that these differences in terms of the vehicles they drive and the safety of them is more pronounced for those uh, young drivers that reside in regional areas. We did some survey work at, in, uh, sorry, at CMARC when I was there. Um, I think we finished at the middle of last year. And I think about 60% um, of the vehicles that young drivers reportedly drove were actually rated between one and three in terms of safe vehicle ratings. And four and five is the highest rating. Compared with older drivers, about 70% of the vehicles they drove were four and five star rated vehicles. Why is it that young drivers are driving these sorts of vehicles? Um, Largely, it's because they don't have the finances to afford safer vehicles. And in 55% of cases, they purchased their own vehicle. And I think in about another 20% of cases, it was the vehicle was actually handed down to them. So it's the old thing about, you know, why bother putting them in a safe car because they'll only have a crash? Well, that's the reason why they should be in, in a safe car. But there are many young driver crash types, in other words, single vehicle, loss of control, rear end crashes, and even head on crashes, which could be improved if they were driving vehicles or that risk of being involved in that crash could be improved if they were driving a vehicle that had electronic stability control. And that, was a, that feature was reported uh, amongst very few young drivers. Uh, lane keeping assist so they're not wandering off the roads and autonomous emergency braking so they're not rear end crashing as well because young drivers tend to drive too close and too fast to the vehicle in front. But how do we promote the uptake of safe vehicles? And this is the really difficult thing here. Parents have to be more involved in the process of selecting cars for young drivers. And my wife and I had to put our money where my mouth was in terms of they need to be driving safer vehicles. And of course, we had to tip in a fair bit of money to ensure that our children were driving cars which would afford them a fair degree of protection 
uh, should they be involved in a crash, and even protection for their occupants as well, because we know that they're going to take their kids around. I was not going to let my sons have a car unless it was a car that also had side curtain airbags in the rear, because I wanted to ensure that their passengers were also protected. In this report we did to the Road Safety Commission last year, we actually came up with a framework for promoting the uptake of safe vehicles. I'm not sure what the Road Safety Commission has done in that regard. Safe roads and road signs. We know the quality of the roads is quite an important feature in protecting drivers from being involved in crashes and also being injured should they run off the road. Um, so to give you some examples here, building flyovers and introducing right turn lanes with green arrow signals at intersections to reduce cross traffic crashes, audible edge lines, um, widened and sealed shoulders to avoid running off the road, um, dividing roads with medians and centre line barriers and clearing roadsides from objects such as you know large trees and the like and putting in barriers to stop them, and particularly wire rope barriers, which are very effective in reducing injury severity. When it comes to young drivers, I've already said, they're particularly prone to single vehicle loss of control crashes. Now, what is this due to? Is it due to a lack of vehicle control skill and experience or an inability to read the road when they go into a curve they don't understand how they should be positioning themselves in that curve or the speed that they should be at. Other work we've done actually showed that a lot of our roads in Western Australia, out in regional remote areas, are not significantly marked with road markings and chevrons to actually explain the curvature of the road. So more could be done in regards to that. Is it intentional risk taking? Are they running off the roads because of speeding there? Or is it because they don't drive these safer vehicles? Or is it because it's a road that has a poor level of infrastructure? It doesn't have enough uh, guideposts or line markings or chevron markers to indicate the curvature of the road. So what is it that road managers can do here? They have a responsibility to constantly be looking at the road network in terms of where crashes are occurring doing their audits to try and determine whether that road has a sufficient infrastructure to not only protect older drivers, but younger drivers in particular. And they've got to come up with the most effective treatment. I think Main Roads does a particularly good job at this. Um, I was hoping there'd be more people from local government here because they're the ones that really need to look in their own backyard in terms of what their roads are like and constantly doing reviews and audits to ensure that they uh, are getting them up to scratch, not just for younger age drivers, but also older age dr drivers. If we're looking at safe speeds, the whole idea here is to set speeds across the road network, uh, which reduce the risk of crashing and also reduce the risk of serious injury, because if you are crashing at a lower speed, there's less energy, kinetic energy in that collision such as minimising injury here. So it's not going to benefit just young drivers, it'll benefit all drivers if we have these reduced and appropriate speed limits here. But speed limits are a real vex issue in Western Australia for some reason. We have a great deal of trouble accepting that we should be slowing down. It makes no sense to me that we have an open speed limit of 110 kilometres an hour on a very narrow road with no centre median, no grade separation at all, or no audible edge lining, no sealed and widened shoulders, but it's still 110 kilometres an hour. That is not an appropriate speed limit for a road like that. Vehicles are passing each other within metre and metre and a half of each other. We cannot accept we need to change the speed limit on that. So safe speeds and young drivers and speedings is a particular problem, particularly in regional and remote areas where we know crashes occur at very high speeds and of course have there's a higher risk of death and serious injury there. So what compounds the risk of injury at high speeds in these locations is because the speed zoning is often not commensurate with the road infrastructure there, that needs to change. 
there's a comparatively lower use of safe vehicles by younger age drivers in these regional and remote areas. So in other words, when they're crashing at higher speeds, there is a greater risk of injury because of lower crash worthiness and also because they, their vehicle may not have the feature like electronic stability to control to avoid runoff road crashes. Fatigue and drink driving, driving are rel comparatively high co-occurring factors with speeding in these areas and there's a high collision uh, of collision with roadside objects. So in thinking about trying to limit young driver speed related crashes, it's not just the behavior of trying to get them to slow down. We have to construct a network that actually has some controls and benefits in place to get people to slow down. And we also have a low level of policing in that area. I'd like to talk just very briefly about graduated driver training and licensing. It, it may seem that this is a relatively new term, but we've had sort of variations of graduated licensing around for many, many years. You know, in Australia, we have had P plates, we've had, you know, provisional licensure periods, we've had L plate periods, we've had alcohol restrictions and the like. And even at times we had lower speed limits for young novice drivers as well, which were disbanded and done away with many years ago. We've seen to have frozen. We're stuck. Is there a message in this? <laughs> I'm not going anywhere here for some reason. Yeah. Ah, there it is. Okay. Yes. Um, interestingly, graduated licensing in terms of the contemporary versions were really pioneered in um, North America and in New Zealand. Um, strangely, however, <laughs> it didn't emerge until sort of the late 1990s, early 2000s in Australia. And we went through a period, probably mid 1990s, where we were actually quite resistant to introducing graduated licensing concepts. The, the old Federal Office of Road Safety had commissioned the Monash Accident Research Centre to undertake a whole program of research in young drivers to actually inform countermeasures in this area. And I can remember attending a national meeting in 1995, looking at how do we progress these recommendations. And the recommendations were about zero VHD. They were about passenger restrictions, vehicle restrictions, time of day of driving restrictions, nobody would accept them. They said the community just will not tolerate this. No one will buy into these sorts of issues. You have to get the community on board with this. And particularly around mandatory hours of supervised driving, they thought this was just such an imposition that you would get parents to say they had to do a certain number of hours. But what we have seen over the years nationally is there has been around about a 5% reduction per annum for that period 2008-2017 um, in drivers aged seven, 17 to 25 years being killed. Now, is that 5% per annum reduction on average due to GDT and L programs or is it due to other things that are going on, like people slowly are getting into cars that have safer features? and the like. In Western Australia, we kicked off our GDT and L program in 2002, and I had the opportunity to be involved in the planning of it. And it was a very difficult process because on one hand, we knew what was seemingly working best from the experience elsewhere, overseas like New Zealand and, and North America, but we couldn't get the same features here. Hard to believe that in the first tranche of our program, there was no minimum learner driver permit period. You know, we said there's going to be, you can get your learners at 16 and you can still get your P's at 17, but there was no minimum learner driver permit period. So what were people doing? They were already 17 when they went into supposedly phase two and they were through the process in and out the door very quickly. So in other words, it was undermining the whole business about an extended program to try and get people to have extended supervision. 
Our program has evolved over time. You know, we've introduced uh, time of day driving restrictions. We haven't introduced vehicle restrictions in terms of power to weight ratio like some other jurisdictions have. There just wasn't enough evidence for that here to suggest that it would work. And there's no evidence to suggest that it does work elsewhere anyhow. But our program overall still falls short of best practice. There are things that we could still be doing. Having said that though, I'm not going to be critical of GDT and L because it really is the thing that's made them, I believe has made the most difference in WA in terms of safety for young novice drivers. But how effective really is the GDT and L? If you ask me to put a figure on it, in terms of the reduction associated with it, I can't tell you, and I don't think anyone really in this room can tell you. Deb? Sorry? No, we have tried to evaluate the GDT and L, but the problem is, is there's not reliable licensing data around this. When we try to do pre GDT and L cohort comparison, with those going through the GDT and L program, we couldn't identify who was in that group, how long they'd been in that group, and when they got their license. A lot of it was to do with the changeover to trellis. Everybody got the same licensing date. So we just couldn't identify when people got their license and how long they'd been licensed for. But there seems to be some evidence to suggest there has been about a 50% reduction in the age-specific population fatality rate. That's not just drivers, that's all road users in that age group. But again, you have to ask the question, is it actually due to GDT and L or is it due to a whole range of other factors that we've got? Uh, we've introduced roadside drug testing in 2007. We've you know, massively increased our level of um, automated speed enforcement and the like. Kids are slowly getting into vehicles, which is safe for them. It's very hard to say exactly which features and which components, which countermeasures have really contributed to that reduction in the rate. So moving forward, some motherhood statements here. We talk about safe systems, yet strangely enough, we are still siloed. That's the way things go about it. You don't necessarily see all departments who have responsibility for these various areas conversing with each other as they should. Um, education needs to be more involved. And thankfully, again, that we have the Sadira program that does that. But you think about all of the topics and the curriculum in high schools, to what extent do we take the opportunities to use those units and curriculums to actually link it in with road safety, whether it's physics, whether it's maths, whether it might be sociology or even psychology that the kids are doing. Do we take, it, take those opportunities to actually focus on road safety, which is a huge thing for these kids going through high school? We need this comprehensive integrated strategy. There should be a standalone strategy the young novice drivers here, but there hasn't been. Who were the stakeholders here? And they operate at the community, local, state, and national level. Uh, is there anyone from Roadwise here? See, that's a shame. It would have been great because Roadwise is such an important group out in the regional remote areas there to try and link in with them because they are really at the forefront of the, the communities there. We need to understand the resources that these local groups have and other resources that they need. Sorry? Oh, terrific. Thank you very much that they're there, yeah. How they can work together. And we need to make community groups, local area groups, local governments somehow accountable and responsible. If we're going to give them money to support them to do things, we need to set targets for them, goals, and actually make them accountable. Um, so to get further funding. Not all novice drivers are the same. Males are different to females. Some interventions are probably more beneficial for males and females. Um, Aboriginal versus non-Aboriginal, that tends to get lost in our discussions here. I'm not even sure whether Sadira picks up on some of that. Do you, Deb? That's good to hear, yeah. Migrant versus non-migrant here. Michelle has mentioned some of the issues around that. So who needs what and what works best for that group? 
Most importantly, I think we can continue to strengthen and support the GDTNL program uh, in Western Australia, but we need good surveillance too. And I think this is part of the problem. We set up countermeasures and we don't have enough forethought about the data that we need to collect and how we're going to collect it to be in the best position to make judgments about what's working and what's not working and why. I'm a big believer in this Japanese philosophy called Kaizen, which is the benefits of marginal gains. We tend to want to look for a silver bullet, but there are no magical or silver bullets. All of there is is small gains from a lot of interventions, and all of these small gains will add up, all of these marginal gains will add up for significant change. So if you think something is not going to be big enough on its own right, but in conjunction with something else, it will. And that's the way we have to approach young drivers. Look at it in terms of roads and vehicles and speed, speed zoning and training and licensing and education, all contributing marginal gains to make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. question here on the webinar. Um, when you mentioned protective behaviours or protective health behaviours, are they so? Are health-related behaviours, including drive, driving safely, linked to socioeconomic status? Um, you don't really. I know that there's some research which suggests that that is the case, but it does cut across all social socioeconomic groups. But certainly what you do see is that when parents who use illicit drugs, who smoke and they drink, and they're supervisors of kids, their kids tend to have greater involvement in crashes and greater risk-taking behaviours. And when we looked at young drivers themselves and asked them about their own um, health-related behaviours, as I mentioned, those that use sunscreen frequently, those that drank moderately or not at all, those that exercise regularly, um, those that didn't smoke, they were the ones that were least likely to be engaged in speeding behaviours in life. And there is some evidence around that socioeconomic status has something to do with those other sorts of behaviours like drinking and smoking. Anybody else have any questions for Peter? Oh, I, I do. Yeah, we were talking about young people believing that their skills were greater than what they are and therefore they're less likely to be involved in a crash. And I know that some driver training programs have actually done that. They've put kids in situations and shown them that you're not that capable of controlling a vehicle when put into this sort of situation. So showing them the limitations of their skills. Now, in, in terms of uh, training programs, I think that has been effective and, and also resilience training has been effective to um, ward off peer, the effects of peer group pressure as well. So if you're going to do any sort of training around that, you know, apart from education, I would consider that, yeah, probably highlighting the limitations of one's skills and getting kids to do resilience training is probably going to be of some great benefit. So our next presenter is Rose Power. Rose has been in education for 36 years with specialist training in home economics and mathematics. Her teaching experience includes kindergarten to year 12. She has been a classroom teacher, head of department, career advisor, health and physical education teacher and vocational and education program manager. Rose has worked for school drug education and road aware for 13 years, which is now the Department of Education, Road Safety and Drug Education branch. Rose has lived in the wheat belt for 34 years and is passionate about helping young people stay safer and improving outcomes for youth so that they stay safe in the wheat belt. Um, thank you and welcome everyone. I'd like to pay my um, respects to the elders past, present and future and hope that they always walk on these lands. So my role is primarily working with schools across the Wheatbelt. So I cover a vast area. 
but part of that work with schools is also about capacity building and connections with communities. So I'm going to present to you today a strategy that is not housed in the Department of Education and Training, that's a community-based strategy, but I'm going to talk firstly before I do that about um, road safety in education. So what have we got? So um, there are lots of components that drive road safety in education. Um, first, the first one that we work under is the um, WA Road Safety Education Committee. And this committee was formed in 2003 and they are um, evidence-based and evidence-researched um, committee that put forward uh, education strategies for schools. Um, and of course, it's underpinned by the Road Safety Commission's Towards Zero strategy. The next strategy that underpins us is the um, Towards Zero strategy. And obviously, we all know about that. And we are also funded through the Road Safety Commission, the Road Trauma Trust account, to implement road safety in education in WA. The next one that we work under of course, is our curriculum guidelines. So we work with schools, so we are guided by curriculum focus. So we work under the Australian curriculum, which has been interpreted to the WA curriculum, but we also work under lots of other documents like the kindergarten guidelines, the national quality framework for childcare, all of those sorts of documents. Okay. We are evidence-based. And on our website, you'll find some um, research papers and evaluation papers of some of our programs, but we are also based on evidence research. And there's some um, documents up there on the website as well that you are welcome to go to that will um, provide you with further education. Um, we also work under the Health Promoting Schools Framework as well and that underpins our whole school approach. And these two documents here, particularly the uh, getting it together, a whole school approach to road safety, has the national 16 road safety guidelines for best practice education in schools. And then of course, underneath all of that, we have the resources and the programs that we run. So our programs run across a whole range and we work with all systems and sectors. So previously we were housed by Catholic Ed but still work with all systems and sectors. Now we are, we are with the Department of Education and Training, we still work with all systems and sectors. So in terms of road safety, we have a huge suite of road safety resources and we start with our Smart Steps resource, which primary target is parents and educators of naught to eight year olds. So we provide um, childcare centres and playgroups, et cetera, et cetera, with access to these types of resources and training and certainly um, can give them a raft of strategies in terms of not only teaching road safety from this age, but also connecting with their parents as well. We also have a suite of challenges and choices from foundation right through to year nine in road safety, so the, these ones here cover both road safety, resiliency and drug education, and these ones here are specifically road safety for our secondary students. And of course, then we have our Keys for Life program, which is primarily for year 10 students, those students who are coming up to getting their driver's licence and their learner's permit. And this program um, reaches over 15,000 school students or young people annually in WA. So it's got a huge reach in terms of education. Um, and in the wheat belt and in the regional centres and some of our metropolitan centres, it's also picked up by um, not-for-profits who connect with people who don't have driver's licences. So, for example, um, Calaberran Community Resource Centre recently trained eight people ranging from 15 to 40 using Keys for Life as the basis of their program. And they all pass the learner's permit test at the end of that training. So, and, and when you consider that some of those people have been driving without licences 
for some time. And one lady actually said that she had never driven a car because she'd always been too frightened of it. So um, it does have some great benefits. We also, as an adjunct, are funded through the Mental Health Commission. So some of the resources you see up here are drug focused as well, but obviously there's some synergy between teaching drug education and also responsible road use behaviour. And our CHAT program, which encourages all schools to develop a holistic approach to road safety. So it's not just about what happens in the curriculum, but it's also about what is modelled in the ethos and environment of the school and also what connection and education they can give to parents. So why do we need change makers? So change makers. We want to focus on the safe road use cornerstone of the Towards Zero strategy. And it's about improving behaviour. And how do you measure that? And how do you connect to improve that behaviour? This image here is our recent National Road Safety Week image that we promoted um, the week, was it last week or the week before last? Very simple. We have a, a road safety committee that is a shire committee and we hashtag everything we do with Avon Locals Driving Change and then we do some very soft messaging. But this one was um, for Road Safety Week last week and hence drive so others survive. But what underpins it, underpins it? Well, obviously we lost 25 lives last year in the wheat belt. Um, in, from 2013 to 2017, we've had 941 people killed or seriously injured. This is my backyard. So this is families and communities that I work with. But I think the standout for me is in terms of killed or seriously injured rate per 100,000. So we have a 252.7 per 100,000 are killed and seriously injured rate on average in the wheat belt over that period of time. That is uh, 50 per 100,000 higher than any other region in the state. So it's sort of a standout figure for me that we're in serious trouble. And of those killed or seriously injured, 54.2% were males and 27.3% were aged 20 to 29. So it's telling me that our young people are in serious trouble. Most of the crashes, in fact, 18.8% .8 of people killed or seriously injured is a result of a single vehicle runoff um, and a non-collision. And 55.7% of people killed or seriously injured was a result of hitting an object. So not an, a car, but an object. So it could have been a tree, a kangaroo, a cow, whatever. And 66% of those people killed on average are in speed limits of 110 kilometres per hour. Now, um, and we're on a road network that was built for horse and cart. So if you think about that, and then we put these vehicles on there and we zoom around at 110 kilometres an hour, you can see why we have the um, incidents that we do. We have... Despite the law that says seatbelts have been need to be worn since 1972, we have 9.3% uh, of the people who are killed or seriously injured are not wearing seatbelts. We live in a farming community where farmers drive across roads between paddocks. Parents drive their kids on their farms and no one wears seatbelts in those vehicles. But they don't think about the modelling and what that means to when those people get onto the roads. Um, we do have a little bit of uh, drink driving and we certainly have seen an increase in drug driving in the wheat belt as well. And not just young people, I'm talking mums and dads. That's what the police tell us, that the mums and dads are being picked up as well. And we do know that by research in terms of traffic scene investigation that approximately 31% of all those people killed or seriously injured are tired. And yet when I work with parents and I say to them, how many of you drive from 
Southern Cross to Perth, which is four hours, without stopping, and they go, oh, we all do. So therefore, I know that it's not being modelled. So if it's not being modelled, then our young people don't pick up on it either. So where did change makers come from? So in 2016, the Road Safety Commission asked to run some consultation processes with young people, and they did one in the wheat belt, um, and they worked with Sidera. So what did we do? We targeted students who were in the Keys for Life program, so they had some knowledge of what road safety looks like. We had um, guest speakers. We had um, a young person, Corey Payne, who had survived a crash, a fatigue-related crash, as a wheat belt person. Um, and he came up and presented his story. Um, and then we asked them some questions. So first of all, we asked them what they believe about them as road users. What did they tell us? They told us that they realise there's a risk involved in driving a car. They realise that they won't always be safe drivers. They believe that if they're careful and with luck, they will be safe on our roads. And they believe that accidents will never happen to them. And this is, relates back to that optimism and, and that overconfidence. They are overconfident as road, young road users. So then we asked them what might help reduce the killed or seriously injured in the wheat belt. And they gave us some very clear messages. They said they don't believe more police on the roads will make a difference. <laughs> they believe that rewarding good driving might make a difference. They believe that 90 kilometre speed restrictions for P-plate drivers might make a difference. And this is our young people who are about to become drivers. They believe that limiting the engine size for P-platers might make a difference. Interestingly, they are in favour of no passengers while on red P-plates, which was one of the recommendations from 2008. Um, and they believe that increasing the period of time L-plate uh, people are in L-plate phase might make a difference. They gave us some very interesting answers to what has to change. They believe that we need to have police stations at the pubs in the wheat belt, and you've got to remember that hotels in the wheat belt and sporting bars are the hub of the social life. So they go to the football on a Sunday, and then after the game they all go back to the club room for a few drinks. Um, they believe that cars should be made so that they disable mobile phones when you get in them. They believe that cars should not be able to start unless the seatbelt of the driver is in the hole. I don't know how hard these technologies are to introduce, but this is quite interesting. Um, they believe that there should be speed limiters in cars for novice drivers so that they, like trucks, can only go to a certain speed and then the vehicle won't let them drive any faster. So it was some really interesting um, facts came out from those young people. At this forum, we also, oh, they gave us um, four key take-home messages. Fix the roads. The dream would be the endless bucket of money that would happen. Lower the alcohol limit introduce more newer technology to save lives and we need to educate about taking a break and beware of fatigue, the silent killer. So those were the four take-home messages that we asked for, we asked from them. We also did a pledge with them and it was a very simple pledge and we asked them to think about the information that they had just looked at and focus on a road user behaviour that they wanted not to demonstrate. We asked them to sign a pledge and we asked their friend to co-sign it. So we said, you sign the pledge, but you're going to be his Jiminy Cricket from Pinocchio. And the idea was that when they started driving, they would do a check-in with each other. Now, this was just an idea that was born in my head, but I also had read previously when I was looking at Keys for Life, because Keys for Life actually has a pledge in it. 
thought, I wonder what the research around pledges is. So I was aware that pledges do, do and can have some impact. So what happened then? Um, at that time, shortly after, there was a road, Great Eastern Highway Road Safety Alliance formed, and they were looking for something to influence the whole of Wheatbelt population. So I put together a grant application for change makers. The only problem was they wanted to focus on just about every road user behaviour that affects our young people in the wheat belt. So it looked like this. So I presented this to the committee and on the committee at that time there was a Road Safety Commission representative and he took this um, project grant in its draft form. So no one in the committee, we hadn't had any input or editing or anything and he went, this looks really good and took it away. Unbeknownst to me, he sent it away to an advertising co um, company called, or behavioural company called um, 303 Mullen, Mullen Low, which is a Perth-based company. It must be someone the Road Safety Commission used. And they supported the pledge because they had some evidence that it may work. So they actually came back. They spent $10,000 on this um, report from this company. Um, and they came back with that in its entity as it stood, it was a good strategy. There was a little bit of tweaking they wanted to do. Um, they said that the written pledge was a good idea with the Jiminy Cricket. Um, they said that if it's presented in groups, rather than just handed out to individuals, it would have more impact. And they wanted durable forms and formats of display of reminders. So what happened then? So we took the draft, we refined it, we came up with some objectives. I'm not going to read them out. They are in the handout summary notes that I've given to you. But it was about encouraging young drivers. It was about raising the awareness of their behaviours. Um, and it was about reinforcing positive behaviour, which is one of the feedback that the kids have given us, positive behaviour. So it's got some primary targets. So we are targeting all the Keys for Life participants in the schools this year, and it's just started its rollout. And we have got a secondary target. So we're targeting the young demographic that are killed and seriously injured in our roads that are not school age. And we are targeting their influences. So people that are around them and conscious of what they're doing on the roads. And of course, the broader communities. We can't forget, we need to take the whole community along with the journey. So as I said, the Road Safety Alliance was formed. While all of this process was happening in the background, that committee collapsed. So then when the grant finally was ready to go to the Road Safety Commission, I needed new partners. <laughs> I went to my Shire of Northern Road Safety Committee and said to them, will you partner me with this? Um, the Northern Safer Community Committee was supportive of it. I talked to WA Country Football. They actually supported the um, grant application and I've been working with them since. Department of Sport have come on board and we certainly are talking with regional sporting associations because we know that that's where the behaviour happens. That's where they take their risks when they go to their weekend sport, which is interesting because it resonates with some of the research that's been presented today. So it evolved to this. So what they're going to receive, the sporting clubs and things are going to receive some posters to put up in their venues for eight months. They're going to receive the pledge, pledge pack, which consists of a little snippet of information about road safety in the wheat belt, the pledge itself, an in addressed envelope to send it back in because we're going to create a database just for a survey monkey at the end. They get a sticker that goes on the top inside of their windscreen. That's for the driver. They're the ones making the pledge to change their behaviour. And they're going to receive a key ring that says hashtag changemaker because we want to challenge them to change their behaviour. <clears throat> it's going to come with some support things. So we're going to, we're running a Facebook page and we're going to ask them to like it. 
the Facebook page will be used in the eight month period. Um, and there we did our first soft rollout of during the National Road Safety Week. Interestingly, what we have learned about Facebook is that there's two ways that you can advertise. You can advertise as a, um, in a reach, which will just say it's had a thousand images produced, or you can go for engagement. So we're going to go for engagement because we want to know actually who is engaging with this page. We don't want to know how many people have clicked through it on their screen. We want to see exactly what's happening in terms of engagement. So we've got a campaign. We're going to do fortnightly posts, and those posts might, might be just a simple message is, how's Changemaker Live Longer My Wheat Belt going? Question mark. So not necessarily always going to be a link to some information or um, a pictorial reminder but it's going to be used in lots of different ways. We're obviously going to, going to tackle the big five, drink, drug, driving, speeding, fatigue, inattention. Interestingly, mobile phones are a bit frustrating in the wheat belt because often they don't work between towns, so that might not necessarily be an influencer, and seat belts. We're going to look at, um, with the young people, so next term, the Road Safety Commission are doing their research for their next towards zero strategy. They are coming to the wheat belt. They're going to target youth in three areas, and we're going to launch Changemaker with those people at that event. Um, and we're going to run a competition with them because we have some money funding for radio. Um, so we're going to actually challenge the kids to write the radio adverts to connect with those people. So they're going to be asked to present us a script for 30 seconds or they can do a voice, what we call a voice pop recording. So there's some programs you can download on your phones. We know kids love technology and they can actually record their 30-second their advert ready to go live using that technology. So we're going to ask them to present those to us and we've got um, a couple of really nice prizes for them that they can spend on technology because that's what they love. So we've already started some soft rollout. So, for example, Adam Football Association had their built-up round last week. Northern Roadwise Committee have been working with that association over a period of years now in terms of road safety. So engagement with them was, yes, we'll do it. So last week at all their sporting venues, all their teams got the Changemaker pack. They got a blurb in their program. Um, they put something on their Facebook page and they sent it out to all their club um, officials to support the strategy and they've now got the posters and things in their venues as well. Um, Avon Hockey Association are looking at rolling out in the next two weeks and I haven't quite connected with the netball. But how do you evaluate behaviour change? And there lies the challenge. What we can do is we can look at our reach with our radio adverts because they can provide us data on how many times they were played, at what times they were played and what the audience trajectory was at that time. So when we do our radio adverts, we're going to ask them to target 17 to 30 year olds. They know through their studies when those people listen to the radio stations. So they'll air the adverts when they're most likely to be listening to them. We know from our newspaper we're not running any newspaper adverts but we are writing some articles because those articles will connect with the influencers but not the young people they don't read newspapers these days we're going to so we'll get some data from those in terms of circulation buy etc we'll certainly have some data from facebook because if you pay for your facebook adverts you get data around engagement um, all of that sort of stuff. So we'll know what's happening and been happening in those spheres and we'll be able to look at which types of posts work better than others. Um, and we are, one of the reasons why we're creating the database is that we're going to do a short four-question monkey survey at the end of it. And that monkey survey will go up on Changemakers and it'll be emailed out to all those people who have sent their emails or phone numbers 
and we'll just ask for four simple questions to get some feedback from them. Um, so we, one of the recommendations from Malone was um, a reach of around 6,000, which is about 25% of our population. So we do 6,000 change maker packs to get out in the next month and a half, and we'll roll that campaign for eight. So that's it for me. Do you have any questions? Uh, there is a report available. You've got my email address and I can email it to you. That report's not on our website, but yeah, it's there and it went to the Road Safety Commission. There was just a question online in regards to evidence um, that ple about pledges. Do you know if there's much evidence to show that the pledge... Yes, um, and if you open up the uh, PowerPoint um, where I referred to Malone's feedback. Did I put the link on it? Maybe I didn't. No, I did. So there's a link on that PowerPoint. So if you've got the PowerPoint presentation, it's there. But so in the handout? Then. In the handout. And if you can't read it, email it to email me and I'll get it to you. Yes. Mm. Mm. Um, well, it came from it came from who's likely to be in the car with them was one of the things. So if that person that was signed co-signed observes some behaviour that's not not right, it was about giving them the confidence to go. Hang on, mate. <laughs> you know, I'm your Jimmy Cricket, and that's not good. Mm. Mm. It's hurting someone else, yeah. Thank you. Did you have a question, Michelle? Yeah. It'll be geared to the 15 to uh, 17 to 29 year olds. Well, there will be a bit of Twittering as well, but I'm not that confident on Twittering. <laughs> uh, so we chose Facebook because they do have, although they don't use Facebook, most of them have a Facebook page. So it was about, you know, if you go to your Facebook, there's a purpose and this is your purpose. Yeah. yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah. The issue with um, Instagram and Twitter is we can't necessarily get data. So, and if we're going to be spending, yeah, I haven't learnt the Twitter platform yet. That's the next challenge. So, yeah, yeah. So, it's about where we can get some data from it. And remember that influencers, our influencers, do use Facebook. So it's also about maybe them going, oh, have you seen this? Or I was reading something, let me show you. So that's just another question in regards to the slide that's on the screen at the moment with the, um, the research being from 1991. Somebody had asked if you know of anything more recent that they could look at, just in the top one. Um, this paper here that was commissioned by the Public Service Commission will have more information. That was just a quote that Mullane drew from it, but there, that is a public sector service commission research document there. Okay. Great, thank you. This one. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Any last but not least? <laughs> Mm. 
I don't like it now that we went back to the top. So, um, now I'd like to introduce Christine Smith, the Road Trauma Support Manager at Injury Matters. Christine will be providing an overview of the Road Trauma Support Program and the services that we can offer to the community. Sorry, just a moment, we're just getting the slide. Uh, well, um, Glenda's doing that. Thank you, Glenda, because she's reading and she's trying to navigate the computer as well, so she's doing that very well. Um, good job. So I'll get started anyway, I'm conscious of time. Um, there's probably a few, in, a few of you in the room that know a bit about the Road Trauma Support Service, and there's probably some that may know a little bit, um, but I guess this is a perfect opportunity to um, talk more about how, road, how injury matters and our Road Trauma Support Service actually can help um, assist people beyond the road crash. Um, so road trauma supports a free statewide service for assisting anyone affected by road trauma, regardless of when the incident occurred, um, what level of involvement the person had. Um, and it's a service that's funded through the Road Trauma Trust account. Okay, sorry. Um, service funded through the Road Trauma Trust account and contract managed by the Road Safety Commission. Um, We've talked this morning about the fatalities and the serious injuries and seen the data that comes with that. Um, what, all, what we haven't spoken to as, as of yet is the aftermath of a road crash. So that's what road trauma support is here for, is to assist those people that have been directly or indirectly involved in a road crash. Um, we do that um, by providing information and support, and that can be in the form of resources, education um, resources, fact sheets, um, fact sheets and um, they're all accessible on our um, Road Trauma website. Um, we also have a variety of um, more in-depth issues so um, talking about coping with um, after, the, after the road crash, if you've witnessed a road crash, there's also some spe specific fact sheets around supporting a child who's, um, who's lost someone in a road crash. Um, other topics are which are relevant for the um, for the youth as well is driving phobias. We also see that coming through if they had experienced a road crash um, younger. Then, when it comes to getting their license, there could be some phobias related to that. But also, people who have been involved in a crash, um, there are also phobias that um, that are displayed in, in that sense as well. So we can help with all of those through fact sheets. Um, we do provide education and training. They're more on a um, as needs basis, and we sort of customise those to suit. But we have been delivering to um, WA Police through our major crash and traffic enforcement group about um, understanding grief and loss that happens with a road crash and also how that can support people that have been um, directly involved who may have witnessed and also themselves as well um, if there's any self-care strategies that they need to consider. We also provide a counselling service which is a free service and we do that in person um, through our leadable office and we can also provide it via telephone and um, Skype. Um, so threw this one in as of yesterday, um, there were 63 road fatalities. What goes with that, as I mentioned before, is the aftermath of that and dealing with the impact that that has on people long after the crash. Who do we help? We help people that are bereaved by road crashes. Um, that extends to family, friends, um, co work colleagues, people that have been injured in a crash. And again, that extends to family, friends, work colleagues, and also people that are caring for those that are injured. So often um, in, in serious and catastrophic events, um, the Insurance Commission here in WA will pay out for catastrophic events, but they actually don't pay to support um, the family in being able to care for that person. So we, we can provide that psychological support to be able to assist them. Um, witnesses and first responders, including emergency services personnel and drivers who cause crashes and their families as well. Um, talking, um, as Rose was talking earlier in terms of the regions, um, often those emergency personnel who are attending to those road crash victims often know 
um, the vic victim or know the family of or know someone who knows someone else. So um, the impact in um, the regions is certainly exacerbated. We and and also dealing with drivers who cause crashes. Um, very earlier on, when we heard Peter speak, we were talking about um, how the, the systemic issues are not. Not everybody intends to have a road crash because the intent's not there, um, and it is at times a mistake. It's a genuine mistake on on the driver. So we also um, accommodate them. Just some of the psychological effects of road traffic crashes that are out there. Um, mental health is often overlooked um, in comparison to the physical health outcomes. Um, and research shows that the psychological in impact um, is it extends to survivors, their family and friends, and it can be quite profound. It can lead to longer term consequences, such as grief, depression and guilt. And again, all those things when we are talking with you, um, those, those things can manifest and it may not present until later um, later on. So I guess the key message for us is is trying to <laughs> intervene in it at, as early as we can um, so that their longer term health and wellbeing, um, um, that they have a better chance, um, I guess, of improving their health and wellbeing. Other issues that they experience beyond the crash um, are the impacts that they have to their social life, work, school and community. We talk about the financial costs that happen with a road crash. These are the social and the personal costs that happen. Um, and again, exacerbated in regional areas, particularly if um, there's a road crash and there's two, the, the two, two cars involved um, can actually divide a community um, if there's any blame that goes along there. So. Um, those are things that really need to be considered and things that as a, as a statewide service we can support um, you guys with. Financial difficulty, if they're, the, if they're the income earner that is seriously injured or um, killed in a crash, that the longer term consequence of all of that just manifests. Um, as to insurance dispute, compensation matters, coronial and forensic issues, these things can go on for two years, three years. Um, and at each point, that actually that actually um, injects another element of triggering and re-traumatising that person through that road crash um, incident. The other thing I just want to mention too is media intrusion. We work, um, we get quite a few requests from the media um, to have to have um, clients of ours to be presented for stories, um, road adverts, the upcoming consultation strategy, um, and. We're quite careful in how we manage that as a service because we don't want to re-traumatise and re-trigger events for our clients. And we also, in terms of supporting the community element of that, not everybody has come to see us. Um, we're conscious that there's others that don't need our service and that's fine, but we're also conscious that some of those stories that are, that are perpetuated in the media can actually re-trigger people as well. Um, Just who does need additional help? Um, most of us don't. Most of us get support from most get support from family and friends, um, and and that's great. It's us informing family and friends and how they can best support um, people, and that's the information that you'll find on our website as well. Um, there's a moderate risk that 35% um, may need may need some sort of support, not ne not necessarily therapy. Um, and then there's those ones at higher risk, um, and that's where there could be some complex grief and bereavement issues um, and can manifest into post-traumatic stress. And that's when they may need to see a service such as our counselling service. Um, I've gone through a little bit how we help just in terms of our fact sheets, all of our, um, we also provide links and referrals to external agencies. Um, and just with our education and training workshops, we um, deliver those on understanding grief, loss and trauma and self-care strategies. With the police, we um, talk about notifications. Um, we are often asked to come into regional towns, um, often when there's an incident that has occurred in the region. Um, we may come, come in a few, few weeks, months later and work with the region, so we'll get quite a mixed cohort of who's in that group, um, varied first responders. Um, so our counselling service, 
Um, it's a specialised grief and trauma serve, counselling service by qualified counsellors. Actually, at the moment, we have two registered psychologists on our team and a specialist bereavement counsellor. There's no referral that's needed to access the service. Um, no limit on the number of sessions and no time frame for when the incident occurred. So if it occurred a week ago or two weeks ago, um, people can access our service. They just need to, to phone us. If it happened 20 years ago, they can still access our service as well. So um, it's fortunate that the service um, allows, you know, has the opportunity to allow that service to occur for people. Um, mentioned earlier, delivered face to face, over the phone and online. Um, again, it is a free service. We're not a crisis service, so at that immediate, if, if it's happening at that immediate time, that event, um, we would we would recommend that it, there would, there's another um, service better than ours to be able to deal with that, and we would normally refer that through to a crisis line service such as Lifeline um, or Beyond Blue. I'm trying to think of some others, um, but and we and we don't we operate from nine till five. Um, this is how you can access our service. Um, we have a free free call number one three hundred. Um, I've popped on there our social media because one of the things that is really useful for us, if there is a road um, crash that's happened in your in your area, to be able to um, link link people through to our page um, is quite useful for us. It's quite tricky as a service to be able to make those connections without make without it looking like we're trying to get your business sort of thing. So, um, and also being an authority in that area in your region, if if you're an authority and you um, can refer that service through, then that, that comes with a lot more weight in it than um, through us. Um, and I've gone through very quickly. So um, I guess that's it for me. Is there any questions?